Welcome to Sword of the Spirit, written and presented by Colin Dye, Senior Minister of Kensington Temple and leader of London City Church. Sword of the Spirit is a dynamic teaching series equipping the believers of today to build the disciples of tomorrow. We pray that you find these programs inspiring and a catalyst in deepening your knowledge of God, your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, and your intimacy with the Holy Spirit. Hello and welcome to the Sword of the Spirit, a school of ministry in the Word and the Spirit. We're talking about Jesus as the Son of God, knowing the Son, and this comes by revelation. When the Apostle Peter declared, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, Jesus said, this hasn't come by your own thinking. This is not the teaching of man, this is the teaching of God. God the Father has revealed this to you. Now throughout the series of the Sword of the Spirit, we focus on God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. We call this the Trinity. There is only one God, but this one God has revealed himself as existing eternally in three glorious persons, Father, Son, and Spirit. And in this series of programs so far, we've been emphasizing the relationship between God the Father and God the Son. And that's quite natural, because if we speak about Jesus as the Son of God, we naturally want to know, well, who is the Father? So we speak about Father and Son. Son speaks of Father, and a Father speaks of Son. But in today's program, we're going to look at that third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, and see how the Holy Spirit featured in the mission of Jesus Christ. And for this, we need to understand that Jesus is the Christ. In other words, he is the anointed one, because the word Christ means anointed. Jesus is the Mashiach. He is the anointed one. Jesus is the Christus, that's the Greek version. Jesus is the anointed one. That means that Jesus has a special relationship with the Holy Spirit. The Bible says that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and he went about doing good and healing all those who were oppressed by the evil one. So we understand that there's a special relationship between Jesus the Son and the Holy Spirit. It was the Holy Spirit who empowered Jesus to do the miracles, to preach the gospel with power. Now it's not that Jesus as God needed something extra before he could perform miracles. He could have used his own authority as the Son because he is God in the flesh. But instead, as the Son, he yielded to the Spirit's power. And that's the topic of today's teaching. Hello and welcome back to the Sword of the Spirit teaching on Knowing the Son. And we've come to this point in the teaching series where we emphasize the relationship between Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Every Gospel writer acknowledges that something new began when Jesus came. A new age dawned, the age of the kingdom. The time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is here, Jesus said. But this also has a special relationship with the coming of the Holy Spirit. Now, in the Gospels, we find that Jesus of Nazareth, who is the Christ, the Messiah, who is anointed by the Spirit, comes by the power of the Holy Spirit. And they show us, each and every one of them, the Gospel writers, that Jesus is the unique bearer of the Holy Spirit, and also the unique baptizer with the Holy Spirit. This is very, very significant. I'm not so sure that we, with our historical perspective, can grasp how significant this was for those people. Because at the time of Jesus, there was a general feeling that the Holy Spirit had departed from Israel. God had not spoken through a prophet for several hundred years. His glory was no longer shining in the temple. The Jews would look back with fond nostalgia and then they'd look forward to the coming of Messiah with expectant hope. When Messiah comes, he'll bring the Spirit. The Spirit will be back. Now Mark leaps over the nativity, cuts straight to the action, and presents Jesus' baptism as the great fulfillment of all these Old Testament hopes. In the first verse, Mark introduces Jesus as Christ, the Son of God. And then immediately, 
makes two radical claims. First of all, he declares that the silence is over. The silence since the age of Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. Now it's over. God has spoken from heaven. And we have his heavenly words recorded in Mark 1, verse 11, where it says, Then a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. What an amazing way to shatter the silence. Of course, John the Baptist was the prophet, wasn't he? He came to bring and uh, they prepare the way for the Messiah. But, but here we have a clear, open heaven experience when God says, yes, the silence is really over. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And uh, we've seen how that this verse, this statement of the Father, combines Psalm 2, verse 7, you are my begotten son, you are my son, this day I've begotten you, with 2 Samuel 7, 14, where it's speaking about the son again, and it, can, it, it takes those uh, verses about the son and combines them with the prophecy concerning the servant of the Lord. Isaiah 42, verse 1, Behold my servant whom I uphold, my elect one in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. And we have seen also how that this servant who appears in the prophecies of Isaiah finds the climax in chapter 53, that he is the messianic ruler, the suffering servant. Next, Mark declares that the drought of the Spirit is over. The silence is broken and the drought has ended. God has poured out his Holy Spirit to equip this messianic servant for the unique mission that God has given him. It's no wonder that in Mark's chapter 1, verse 15, the first words of Jesus are, the time is fulfilled. So we see the Son is the one who uniquely bears the Spirit. He is the Christ. He is the anointed one. Now, uh, throughout the, his gospel, Mark emphasizes that the Son bears the Spirit during his earthly ministry and that the Son uniquely bears the Spirit in the, his days on the earth. But it's only in chapter 13, verse 11, where Jesus is appearing his disciples for the end times, that Mark reveals that the Spirit is going to equip and enable somebody else other than the Son. And that passage there is where Jesus is prophesying about the persecution, and he says, but when they arrest you and deliver you up, do not worry beforehand or premeditate what you will speak, but whatever is given to you in that hour, speak that, for it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. It's much the same in Matthew's Gospel, which also stresses that Jesus is the unique bearer of the Spirit, but Matthew imparts some extra information that Jesus was conceived by the Spirit. And uh, he shows that the Son, therefore, was uniquely associated with the Spirit from the very beginning of his life on the earth. Luke reveals more about the Spirit than the other Gospels and emphasizes the presence and the activity of the Spirit in the birth stories of Jesus. Although Luke shows that Mary, Elizabeth, and Zechariah were also filled with the Spirit and empowered to prophesy, his stress is upon the Spirit activating the life and ministry of the Son of God. He shows, for example, that the Spirit led the Son into the, into the wilderness, that the Son was filled with the power of the Spirit when he began his ministry, uh, and that the anointing of the Spirit, as prophesied in Isaiah 61, dominated and directed the whole ministry of the Son. John's Gospel adds one further revelation about the way the Son uniquely bears the Spirit. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 34, it says that the Son, he bears the Spirit without measure. For he whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for God does not give the Spirit by measure. Now, John the Baptist's disciples claimed that God had given him the Spirit without measure, without any reserve. When Jesus was speaking with John the Baptist's disciples, he describes the fact that he received the Spirit without measure. And uh, he claims then that God had not held anything back in giving the Spirit to Jesus. In this remarkable way, I believe we see Jesus standing again, unique in history, as the only person who's received an unlimited anointing with the Spirit. 
Now, some people who talk about they've received an unlimited anointing, and I, sometimes, I know what they mean sometimes, because when we are baptized into Holy Spirit, we're baptized into all of Him. But I think that when we talk about Jesus bearing the Spirit, He wasn't just baptized in the Spirit, he was bearing the Holy Spirit. He was carrying the Holy Spirit, which shows two things. It shows Jesus' humanity in that he was one upon whom the Spirit came, the man whom, upon whom the Spirit came. But it also shows that he was more than man, for he must have been utterly, totally unique, the Son of God. He must have been God himself to carry and bear the infinite, omnipotent, unlimited Spirit of God. So that's why I say that Jesus had a unique, unlimited anointing because he carried the Spirit in an unlimited way as the Son of God. He didn't only receive the Spirit, but he bore the Spirit. He wasn't just baptized into the Spirit, but he bore the Holy Spirit. So he is the unique bearer of the Holy Spirit. That's how we meet him in the Gospels. But we also discover from the very beginning of the Gospels that he is to be unique in another sense. He is to be the unique baptizer with the Spirit. And uh, this comes through John's announcement and also comes in the book of Acts. And there are very few statements in, in the Gospels that are repeated in all of the Gospels. Of course, we have the teaching of the cross and the resurrection, but John's announcement that Jesus should be the baptizer in the Holy Spirit is is given such emphasis that as far as John the Baptist is concerned, it is the distinctive activity of Jesus himself. And so, when we come to the Gospels with fresh eyes, we can still be surprised that after this introduction to the Son's Spirit-baptizing mission, that they go on describing Jesus doing everything but baptize with the Spirit. It's reserved for some other time. John says, when he comes, he'll baptize in the Spirit. It doesn't happen. Not until Jesus dies and is crucified and then is glorified. Because the whole of the New Testament teaches that in the death, resurrection, and glorification of Jesus Christ, then the age of the Spirit can come. Every gospel looks forward to the day when the Son will send the Spirit to equip the disciples and to share the mission of Jesus. One of the clearest ones is John 7, 39. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. And so here we have the, the demarcation of the age of the Spirit. God's Spirit was going to come after the glorification of Jesus. And in John's Gospel, uh, in the last discourses of John's Gospel, Jesus said, I must go away, and it's better for you that I do go away, because if I go away, then the Spirit will come. So, as we summarize this, we see that the Gospels show the Son was equipped for his unique mission by the Spirit, and the Spirit was not available to others during the Son's earthly life. But after the Son's death, after his resurrection and ascension, the Son received the Spirit from the Father and gave the Spirit to his disciples to equip them to continue in his mission. Now, let me just pause here for a moment, and some puzzle over this. They say, but does this mean to say the Holy Spirit wasn't at work before the day of Pentecost? Not at all. The Holy Spirit, as we see in knowing the Spirit in that series, that he is active from the very beginning. He is active in creation, and the Spirit moved upon the surface of the waters. He is active in anointing the prophets and, and in empowering the kings. He is active throughout the whole of the Old Testament. He's active in the life and ministry of Jesus. Even the disciples know him. They know the Spirit. <laughs> the Spirit, is, he is with you, he says, but then later on he says he's going to be in you. There is going to be an intensification of this when the Spirit comes. He's going to not just be with you in a, in a, a superficial sense. He is going to be, you are going to be immersed in him, and he's going to indwell you in a great and a glorious and in a very grand sense. And so the Holy Spirit, of course, was active in the world. But they, when Jesus is glorified, he sends the Spirit to do a new thing. Not only an intensification of the work of the Spirit, but also the, the Holy Spirit is given extensively to everybody. 
Every believer, every person in the new covenant is eligible for this. Whereas in the old covenant, just prophets, some kings, priests were anointed with oil, but very few others. But in the new covenant, all of us can receive the Holy Spirit. So the Son is the bearer of the Spirit and the baptizer of the Spirit. He also is the revealer of the Spirit. Now this is quite an interesting perspective because we have understood many times that uh, the revelation of God to the world was central to Jesus' mission. He came to reveal God. But this means he came to reveal not just the Father, but also the Spirit. Think about it. When we think of the Spirit in the Old Testament, we see him as the power of God, the unpredictable hurricane, the holy hurricane, God's breath, wind. In the New Testament, he's no longer encountered as a naked power. Instead, he's clothed in the person and in the character of the Son. And so Jesus is as much a revelation of the Spirit as he's a revelation of the Father. That's why the Bible says, not often, but does make at least two references to the fact that the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Jesus. Acts chapter 16, verse 7, and Philippians 1, verse 19 are the two verses there, where the Spirit is called the Spirit of Jesus. In Romans chapter 8, verse 9, he's called the Spirit of Christ. Now, this is not talking about the human spirit of Jesus. Jesus did have a human spirit, you know. Because a human being is body, soul, and spirit. Jesus became fully human. He had a body, soul, and spirit. He had a human spirit. But the Holy Spirit is God. And he, as, as the anointed Messiah, receives the Holy Spirit without measure. And so we're talking about here the spirit of Jesus being the Holy Spirit. And this is meaning the Spirit that was upon Jesus, the Spirit that is in Jesus, the Spirit that's operating through Jesus, and the Spirit that Jesus fellowships with in equal companionship and essence as being God the Holy Spirit. That's what it means here, the Spirit of Jesus. Okay, it means Jesus' anointing, or the anointing of Jesus, who is the Holy Spirit. It's talking about the person of the Holy Spirit. But he is the Spirit of Jesus. Now this is just a a small point, and it's not something we should major on, but it's an interesting point and something we should grasp. So this means that the Son does not just depend on the Spirit for His power, for His direction and enabling, but the Spirit depends on the Son for revelation. What does it mean when Jesus says, the Spirit, He is going to come. You know Him, the world knows, the world doesn't know Him, but you know Him, for he is with you and shall be in you. That's a reference to saying, the Spirit, you know all about him because you know me. Because I am with you, you know the Holy Spirit. Because you have me with you, you have the Spirit with you. In other words, the Spirit has focused his presence and his activity in me. But now, he who is in me is going to be in you. Very powerful scripture. Many are confused as to, as to the meaning of it, and I believe that's the meaning of it. So here, the Spirit is depending on the Son. Let me put it to you this way. When Jesus said that to his disciples, he is with you and shall be in you, the Holy Spirit was probably saying, Amen, Amen. You've been showing them who I am. Now they're going to know for themselves. So here we have mutual inter interdependence in the relationship between the Son and the Father. We've seen this and we're going to look at it uh, again, we've seen it as in knowing the Father, that the Father and the Son mutually depend. The Father depends on the Son, and the Son depends on the Father. The Father depends on the Son to make him known, and yet the Son can't make the Father knowing unless the Father draws them and brings revelation. So there is this mutual dependence, this interdependence between the persons of the Trinity. Those of you that follow through this series, uh, Sword of the Spirit, you know I spend a lot of time throughout all of this series building up the doctrine of the Trinity. It's a much neglected doctrine today. And I don't think we can fully understand 
the, the, the purposes of God without understanding the doctrine of the Trinity. We can't understand our relationship with the Father unless we know the intimacy between the Father and the Son. We can't understand our fellowship with the Holy Spirit unless we begin to grasp how Jesus depended on the partnership. And dependence of the Son and the Spirit. The Son depends upon the Spirit, but the Spirit also depends upon the Son. And so in John chapter 16, verse 7, it says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you, but if I depart, I will send to you. We see here that the Spirit is depending on the Son. Once the Son comes back, then the Spirit can be poured out. What we then can say is that just as the Son localized the presence of the Spirit when the Son was on earth, so now, when the Son is in heaven, the Spirit universalizes the presence of the Son. Maybe you need to think about that before you grasp it. But the point is this, when the Son was on the earth, he brought the presence of the Spirit with him, where he was. But he could only be where he was, on one place, on one, at one time, on one occasion. So the Son localized the presence of the Spirit. Then, the Spirit was depending on the Son. Then when the Son went back to, be, to the Father, the Son received the Spirit from the Father as the authority to give the Spirit, and then the Spirit was poured out into the world, and then the Spirit carries the presence of Jesus. Just as the Son carries the presence of the Spirit, but only one place in one occasion, so now the Spirit carries the presence of the Son, but not just for one place on one occasion, but the Spirit is present in all places, in all, on all occasions. The Son was limited by space and time in his earthly life, but his ascension made possible the coming of the Spirit who is not limited by any of these space-time barriers. Can you imagine if the Holy Spirit was moving powerfully in Kensington Temple one Sunday morning and those people in Holy Trinity Brompton, our nearby sister church, said, Oh dear, the Holy Spirit's moving in Kensington Temple today. He's with them today. He's not with us. Or can you imagine if the next Sunday the Holy Spirit said, Colin, I'm not showing up there, I've got an appointment at, at HTB. No, no. The same Holy Spirit that moves upon us is the same Holy Spirit that moves all over the world. He is the same anointing. Hallelujah. Give him glory. Amen. All right. That's right. Now... This, in the Spirit, the Son can be permanently with all His people all the time. And we can be all in Him, and He can be all in us. This leads me to the teaching on the Parakletos. We cover this in detail in uh, knowing the Spirit, but in John's Gospel, the Spirit is called the Parakletos. This is, literally means the one who is called alongside. It means... Uh, one who is called to bring a witness, essentially. One who's to come to bring testimony. It's translated as advocate, counselor, comforter, helper, intercessor, support, or guide. In John 14, verse 6, Jesus said, When I go, I'll pray to the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. The word for another is alos, instead of the other word which is heteros. Both of these words mean other or another. Alos means another of the same kind. Heteros means another of a different type, a different kind. But Jesus said another comforter is coming. If there's another one, there must be a first one. The first one is Jesus, and the other one is the Holy Spirit, and the other one is just like the first one. The Holy Spirit is just like Jesus, and Jesus is just like the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. That's how we know Jesus, through the Holy Spirit. As we gaze into the sun, <laughs> I'm actually making the other point as well. We know Jesus by the Holy Spirit, but we also have to know the Holy Spirit by Jesus. And that was very much what the experience was for these disciples when Jesus was on the earth. 
And we too, as we look at the Son, we gain an insight into the Spirit. As we listen to the Spirit, we hear the voice of the Son. That's why in John chapter 14, verse 18, it's underlined that He Himself will come in to His disciples through the sending of His Holy Spirit. Now, in the Old Testament, we have at least two occasions when the Spirit and the, anoint the anointing was, was passed on from one person to somebody else. Moses, it says in uh, the Scriptures, Deuteronomy chapter 34 and verse 9, how Joshua... Let me, let me just read it for you, because it says, Now Joshua the son of Nun was full of the spirit of wisdom, for Moses had laid his hands on him. So the children of Israel heeded him, just as the Lord had commanded Moses. So here we have, there is an impartation from Moses to Joshua. The same thing happened from Elijah to Elisha. Read about it in 2 Kings chapter 2. And then Joshua and Elisha, ministered in a similar anointing to uh, Moses and to Elijah. And so in the same way Jesus, who was anointed without, with the Spirit without limit, was allowed to pass on the Spirit to his chosen followers so that they could continue his mission, so that we can begin to do what Jesus did. So this means the link between the Spirit and the Son has very important consequences for the way in which we live and serve as disciples today. This means that the Spirit acts now the way the Son acted in His earthly mission. The Son came from the Father as the Father's gift, so does the Spirit. The Father sent the Son into the world as His representative, so the Son sends the Spirit in His name. The Son remained with and guided the disciples, so the Spirit remains with us and guides us. The Son taught His disciples the truth because He was the truth in person. So the Spirit of truth will lead the disciples into all the truth about Jesus. The Son did not draw attention to Himself but glorified the Father by passing on the Father's message to humanity. So the Holy Spirit will not speak on His own authority but will only take what is the Son's and pass it on to the world. The Son bore witness to the Father so the Spirit bears witness to Jesus. And that brings to an end today's teaching on knowing the Son. And I pray that throughout these programs, God will give you greater and greater revelation concerning Jesus Christ, the Son of God. We'll be back next time with more teaching on knowing the Son. Mm -hmm.